here at the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry Museum in Bodling in Cornwall and we're going to be interviewing Major Trevor Stippling who's very kindly allowed us into this site. Um, for anybody else in the paranormal world could you just note that this is a one-off and no other paranormal teams will be allowed into this site after we've done our vigil here. Um, good morning, Major Trevor Stipley. Good morning, Sue. How are you? Very mm -hmm. well, thank you. Good, Yourself? good. Fine. Well, we're here, as you know, just to do a quick interview and then we can do a walk around. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about when this building was built? The building was built about 150 years ago at the time of the threat to, of Napoleon VI and it was built as a keep to store ammunition and obviously um, as one of the protective areas in Cornwall. Right. And how long was it before this actually became a museum? It only became a, a proper museum when the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry amalgamated with the Somerset and Cornwall Light Infantry and basically then eventually became part of the Light Infantry. At that stage when the barracks closed, this building was all that was left of the barracks so it was converted into offices and a museum. Many men would have been here at any one time? Well you're talking of it being a depot so it was a training regiment and uh, that number would obviously fluctuate depending upon the number of recruits that they had and during times like the First World War and the Second World War then as fast as they could train, equip and put soldiers out in the field they put them through so in those stages hundreds of recruits going through uh, but generally the, the normal depot staff who would be recruiting as many recruits as, recruits as we had here. What was it that actually got you interested in becoming the curator here? I wanted a job. <laughs> no, okay. um, always a slight interest in military history and uh, originally obviously from the southwest from Plymouth and settled in Cornwall when, when I left the army and um, the job was advertised and it was an interesting job really to apply for. Right. Your exhibits that you have here, are they all donations? Yes, entirely donations. And yeah. they're, they're from people whose loved ones or the soldiers themselves? Um, historically, yes. I mean, obviously when the regiment disbanded, the stuff that was left behind from places like the officer's mess and the sergeant's mess formed the basis of the collection to start with. But since then, everything's been donated. Okay. Now, if people want to come along here and actually visit the museum, what are your opening times? And We're opening nine to five weekdays, um, all year round. The only time we close is Christmas. We open bank holidays and Easter, but we close over the Christmas period. This is, this is the main entrance into the keep with the DCLI badge and the Cornwall badge above it. As we walk through the entrance, on the right hand side is the old guard room and on the left hand side are the cells. I think the Cornish are quite canny. If you think it's at the time of the Napoleonic threat, this is built in the style of a French chateau. So had Napoleon been successful, you know, we've built you a property. Fantastic! <laughs> this is all that's left of the barracks. Behind the wall was the square and all the various accommodation blocks, the officers' mess, the hospital, the, the drill shed and everything like that. But obviously when the, bar when the depot closed, this area was all sold off and uh, the wall now is the limit of our property. So how big was the site actually? Do you know roughly? It extends back that way. The Walker Lines extends back about a quarter of a mile. Does it really? It's a really big site. It goes either side between Castle Cranach Road and Lost Withiel Road, all the way back for about a quarter of a mile. Right. And I believe this was part of the old parade ground? It was. Right? The parade ground was immediately the other side of that wall. Right. <laughs> The museum basically is in four parts and this first part tells the history of the County Regiment of Cornwall, the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. The area where we're standing was originally the Quartermaster's store and you can see a hatch in the floor below here, you probably won't pick it up on camera, with the shackle above where everything coming through the tunnel underneath was lifted up into the Quartermaster's store. So basically this was the first part of the museum that was developed and uh, this was sort of, this has been going now for about 30 years, this area of the museum. It tells the history of the regiment, it's laid out in date order from 1702 when the regiment was formed and then takes you all the way through the history of the various battles and conflicts that they've been involved in. It's a picture of Stanhope Forbes' son. Stanhope Forbes obviously was one of the Newlyn School of Artists. His son joined the DCLI and this is a picture painted by Stanhope Forbes of his son and his son, days after this was painted, went to the front line and was killed three days later. 
Stan Hope Falls is never the same afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, basically one of his later pictures. And obviously for us a very valuable and a very sentimental picture. Mm -hmm. if you, well, if you have a look at the weapons as we go around, there are rifles representing everything from blunderbusses, which were originally mounted on the side of ships, um, to the various musketry and leading into the rifles, obviously, which is where we take our name from. The, um, the light infantry soldiers were the first soldiers to be equipped with the Baker rifle. Right. The Baker rifle obviously made it more accurate, fire over a longer distance. So they were chosen men who were sort of, you know, accurate shots rather than the old muskets, which were just pointing in the general direction and blasted off. Mm. These were marksmen. The main battle honour which the regiment celebrate um, is the siege of the uh, residency at Lucknow during the Indian Mutiny. Um, they call it the uprising, obviously we call it a mutiny. And about 3,000 were trapped inside the residency and that included obviously the regiment, their families, um, the residency staff and some loyal Indians. And they held the residency from June to November. And basically when they came out, there were about a thousand left alive. Most of those were walking wounded and were dressed in absolute rags by the time they'd finished. Um, it's the battle honor that they celebrate every year. And uh, basically this is a display of what's there, which includes some of the melted silver that survived, um, the story of the flag, the last flag that flew over the residency and was flown 24 hours a day, was never lowered. And that stayed until 1947, when we eventually pulled out of India. This is a Buddha, captured and brought back from Burma. Um, there are two Buddhas here, the, the, the one which is here, which is in gold gilt, and then the reclining Buddha over the other side. Um, we would not normally be allowed to collect these. We're not allowed to collect them anymore. Um, they're seen as war trophies, so you're not allowed to take war trophies out of other countries. Before those regulations were enforced, then obviously these were brought back and were part of the museum. Start in the area here where we're talking of South Africa. Uh -huh. That's the actual uniform that that sergeant in the photographs wore. Now he looks like a fairly big, fierce type sort of senior NCO with his beard and his, his, and his tall hat on top of him. If you actually look at the size of the uniform now, you'd probably be lucky to get a 12, 13 year old boy in that uniform. They're very small. It's a very small okay. uniform. Yeah. Well, what we have of course here, and you'll see it when we get a bit further around the museum, is we have the collection of artifacts from Harry Patch, and Harry Patch died yes. three years ago, aged 111, and he was the last surviving member who fought it in the trenches at Passchendaele. And he used to come here regularly as one of our soldiers. And he would sit in his wheelchair and just burst into tears looking at that picture. Oh, it's horrific, isn't and it? And say, this is what it's like. You see the, the sort of the films of green fields with slit trenches cutting them. It wasn't like that. It was like this. It yeah. was blood, dead horses, you know, human sort of waste and everything. And that's what they lived in. We just don't realise, do we, this no. generation, how no. horrific it must have been. It displays the Harry Patch collection. Um, as I say, Harry was one of our soldiers. Um, it was his wish that his medals came here. I went to his funeral in Wales Cathedral and his medals were presented to Lady Mary Holborough at his funeral. And she is chairman of our trustees at that time. And obviously they then came to the museum. That's how Harry wore his medals. Uh, at some stage in the future, we would actually put them in the correct order of precedence and display them in our medal room. But at the moment, uh, Harry's got his own little exhibition area. And then the next area, obviously, um, it covers the, the Second World War and um, the main battle that we look at there, the, the 5th DCLI um, involved at Hill 112, which is a very famous battle and afterwards got named Cornwall Hill. Um, and they took heavy losses there, very heavy losses. Mm. And Hill 112 is one of the sort of famous battles of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. What year did that take place? Well, the story is told here, if you have a look, and it starts um, in 1944. The second part of the museum display is the armoury here, which displays medals, weapons and uniforms of the regiment. A complete collection of weapons leading up through from edge blades up to the modern weaponry. And the medals on display here again have all been presented by members of the regiment. We have all of our Victoria crosses, they're shown in the cabinet here. These are actually replicas in here because they're very valuable. All of the originals are in a safety deposit box. Mm -hmm. um, and these are not just medals, which are campaign medals. They are, a lot of them are obviously decorations, OBEs and uh, MBEs and much more senior decorations than that.
And these would all have been from men that once were here. That's right, yeah, very much so. The interesting ones, if you haven't heard the story, is the story of the death plaques. These are up here. These were awarded to the next of kin um, in the Great War. And obviously with about 800,000 people being killed, everybody knew what they were. They came in the post. They were delivered by the postman with a letter from the king and a small cardboard envelope with the individual's name on them. Uh, and in those days, of course, the postman knew everybody on his round. Yes. And because everybody knew what they were, then he would be equally upset. Of course. Because of their size and shape, they were nicknamed pennies. And you would open your door, find them lying on the doorstep. The postman would knock on the knocker, ring the doorbell. You'd open your door and find it lying there. They're the original bad pennies that kept turning up. And that's where the expression comes from. They were like a bad penny. Now there is a superb range of weapons here going through the early muskets and the early rifles obviously. Um, automatic weapons behind us are more powerful weapons obviously shown here, um, including the Lewis gun at the far end which was fired by Harry Patch. And we've got a picture of Harry behind that when he came down to visit the museum. Superb collection of, ha of handguns. Um, uniforms throughout the age and then we have over 300 pictures of the uniforms going back to the formation of the regiment. Lovely story with the bugle that's down here, the commanding officer bugle. We had a gentleman here called Joe Kendall who was our museum assistant and was also a bugler. When he retired he was presented with that bugle and took it away. He died about three years ago unfortunately and his wife returned the bugle to us but before he died he recorded himself playing the last post Oh. And the recording of him playing Last Post was played at his own funeral. Oh. So, you know, Amazing. quite quite significant, yeah. These are very valuable hats here, the Shakos as they're known. Um, a lot of them worn in battle, they made the individual look much taller and much more sort of, you know, sort of for the enemy it was, it was, it was a bit more intimidating. Uh, on the top shelf, the one with the red and white hackle on the side of it, is an, what we call an 1812 Shako. So you're looking there, it was, you know, the Battle of Waterloo at that time. We paid an awful lot of money, we paid £6,000 to buy that one hat. Um, so they didn't actually afford any protection to the soldiers? No, nothing at all, nothing at all. They taller. just make them look bigger, yeah. yeah. Okay. At that time, of course, you're only looking at musket fire, which was generally, sort of, as I say, fairly sort of scattered rather than aimed shots. Yeah. Um, and most of it was done by sword or, or, or bayonet or lance. But this is really a, a peacekeeping period. Mm -hmm. And the artefacts that you see in here, this is the largest section of the Berlin Wall in the country. Oh, wow. And um, then obviously we're representing the French, British and American um, servicemen on one side. And when you go around the other side, the East German and Russian guards on the other side. Interesting to see um, this side of the wall where you've got graffiti all over it and the story of it. When you go around the other side of the wall, you see it's completely blank. And obviously that's the side that the East Germans couldn't get to. Right. What is, what is interesting, and I've never been here before, but as I came down through here, I felt I was being, and I didn't even see the building, to be honest with you, I felt I was being enclosed and I wanted to go really way back in time. And one of the first things I was picking up was, was lots of people here. And I don't know why they're here, but I felt a lot of people that were all here together. Um, they're not sitting, they felt like to me as though they were gathering. So it was a gathering of people here. Oh, I really feel like so something's really got my legs. Real heavy energy. Oh. It's almost taken my breath away here. Oh. Difficulty with breathing. There, um, there's someone here with, with real difficulty with breathing. I feel like I want to go this way. I want to just walk through and see how, if that energy is changing at all. Oh, it's going away there. I thought it might do. It's around here. I feel like I've, I've lost legs. It's like somebody's taken my legs off. It's the first thing I've got. Um, it's like, my breathing is difficult here in my mouth. It's given me something to do with the mouth and the head as well. 
but I feel that's more an injury. I'm looking, I've got the name of Frank coming in, and it really feels like I so very emotional, it's a very emotional feeling that's coming in with this here. But it's like, it's almost like guarding it. It's, it's you come, as you come in, it suddenly hits you. Um, it, it certainly feels a very young man. I think I'm getting Hornby. So that would be Frank Hornby. I'm seeing red on him, on him like red uniform. And, and lots of, lots and lots of people that have lost their lives. And it's like I said, they're, they're piling up. Where, where they are and you know it, it's very sad I'm trying not to get in there too much because it is very very sad situation and I feel like as though I, again I'm wanting to walk forward but I'm feeling as though my legs are really heavy and taking this energy again um, but certainly um, a lot of a lot of destruction and, and a lot of people passing over and um, the, en the energy is really feeling quite heavy. So I'm gonna go through a little bit more, um, see what we can feel from things. And I can still see that man they called Frank. And it's like as though he's not sitting, he's standing, and he likes to stay around that area. You won't wanna come up here by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's definitely a feeling of being watched. I think we've got a lot of spirit eyes on us. It's like I said, they've all gone at the same time. They've all passed into spirit at the same time. A lot of, lot of sadness, a lot of crying. Want to protect the solar plexus here. Oh. Oh, no, no. I feel them all around me. Very, very sad. And yet they, they seem to be almost like they're in a room. And they've just given up. They, 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 they know there's nothing to do. They can't go anywhere. Oh, how weird. I feel really sick in here. Oh. I felt a bit weird in here when we came here that time. Did you? At the top of the, in that, in the next room, anyway. <sighs> Not surprised. It's really getting me. Very, very cold. Um, oh dear. Um, I'm getting a lot of sickness. I'm feeling one male energy in particular here at the minute. Um, I'm feeling quite comfortable, but I'm also feeling his energy and really not, really not happy with him in a minute. Um, Jim, got the name Jim. Oh, this man suffered. I feel he lost his life here. But it's like as though he spent a long time here before he lost his life. Really taking my legs. I feel like I'm floating. It's um, very powerful energy. I feel it's, it's a murder situation. And poor souls struggled and struggled and struggled. Oh dear. Oh, it's struggle. It's terrible. 
very badly treated man, lost his life around this area. It's, it's like a struggle from here, and it comes right around here. It's like, keeps coming like, almost like he's coming out the wall, and he comes out around, and it's like, oh, um, and he's showing you, he gets to here, and he gets this right in the back. Right, well we're here now at Bodmin Keep. It's a very cold night, so we're all rather chilly. But we're in the attic, and this is going to be the first place that we actually start our investigation. Okay, we've got the K2 on the table, which hopefully will pick up any energies that may be around. We've got a voice recorder going on as well. And we also have the ghost box which we'll be using later on. Okay, to any spirit persons in this building, at this venue, in this location, we've come here to have contact with you. You probably haven't been spoken to before. We'll be using a variety of equipment to try and talk to you. I'm out of breath. <laughs> um, <clears throat> These are, we're not trying to get you to do parlour tricks or anything like that. It's the only way we can communicate with you because we may not be able to hear you. If you want to say anything to us, please step forward, come amongst us. A ghost box is just a modified radio that scans white noise in between radio channels. Um, because spirits are supposed to be able to communicate live through, through white noise. Oh, can you tell us your name? I don't think it's Table towards the people and use their energy to move the table in any way that you can. If you can make a noise on it, if you can make it move, vibrate, we'll be very grateful. If you're affecting the lady and making her feel sick, can you step back and perhaps put the energy into the actual table? Can you make it vibrate? Or push it towards the sound of my voice? Keep drawing on the energy of the people in the room and use that to communicate with us. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah, it moves a little bit. Just clockwise about half a centimetre. Okay, thank you for moving the table. <laughs> you do a little bit more for us. Keep drawing on the energy. We push it towards the table. We try and make it move towards the sound of my voice if you can. Just want to communicate with you. Just want to know that you're here. If you can't move it in one great big big movement, then just move it gradually and build up some momentum using the energy of the people around the table. You have our permission to use the energy of the people around the table and the people in the room and all the equipment and the energy in the atmosphere. Yeah, carry on, sorry, Dad. Carry on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Keep using the energy. And use, use it towards the table so that you can communicate with us. Can you try and move the table? Could you try, please, and move the table towards the direction of my voice? 
So we know you've definitely healed us. Table if you're a male. Thank you. Where are you a soldier? Just following you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can just keep following me. Keep moving towards the sound of my voice. Can I just establish that you don't want us here? Could you move the table if you don't want us? Okay, thank you. Change into somebody else. Somebody else. Okay. Is this the quartermaster? Can you move the table if this is the quartermaster? Okay, thank you. And this was your this is your home, wasn't it? This room. Okay. Yeah, I was. Who knows about the quartermaster? Anyone in here? Any of them? Sarah, no? Sarah, 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 there is. Can you take the table to where they are in the room, please? Where are they? few that make many only about three or four cells mm -hmm. um, but we can't get in there tonight because they haven't got the keys for it the building on the left is the old guard room we have got two cameras set up in there and also recording equipment mm -hmm. but it's quite freaky in there we've seen a shadow in there this evening and when Bev and I did our original walk around we were both affected quite badly out here so good luck Go in and see what you can find. <laughs> yes. I'm going for it. Is that camera there? Yeah. What's that camera there? Is there anybody in here that wants to make themselves known to us? Please make a noise, make something move. Do anything you can just to let us know you're here. This cameras play havoc. Hey. The infrared cameras play havoc. Feels a bit funny, isn't it? Yeah. If you want us to leave here, could you move something? Knock.
It's meant to be part of tricks for you. It's just our way of being able to speak to you because we can't hear you. Can you please move the glass in a nice big circular motion around the table if you can hear and see us, please. Is it? Thank there we you. go. Thank you very much. Welcome. Can you keep moving it around the table for us? Build up some energy. Nice big circle all the way around the table for us, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> keep it going all the way around. Use the energy of the people here. The energy of the people around the room. That cracking noise. Yeah. Is that you? No, 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 Were you in the military? Okay. Stop in the centre. Can you stop the glass in the centre, please? Centre of the table. What's he doing? That's a giant knife. Can you stop the glass for us, please? the glass in the centre. Thank you very much. Were you in the military? Were you, is it a yes? Were you in the military? Thank you. Back to the centre, please. Okay. Back to the centre. We'll talk to you if you, if you stop the glass. We can't communicate with you when you're moving it all over the place because then what you're trying to tell her. Okay. So it's to the same two people there, isn't it? Okay. Can you move the glass in a big round circle all the way around the table for us, please? Big circle all the way around the table. Oh, it's doing that. Oh, there are a lot of you here that want to talk. Is that what it is? It's not fighting over it. Okay, we're happy to talk to all of you, but we can only do so one at a time. Can you stop the glass in the centre for us, please? Um, can we have the oldest serving member of the military? Okay, stop the glass, please. Stop the glass. Okay, faster. Okay, stop the glass. Stop the glass or we won't talk to you anymore. Can the senior person take over, please, and stop the glass now? Order them to stop, please. There's an officer here. Can you stop the glass in the middle of the table, please? <laughs> just, just, oh, hello. See that? It's so excited, I think. Can you point to where you are in the room? Can you point to where you are in the room? You're everywhere. I get that. No. Yeah, okay, stop the glass, please. We can't communicate with you like this. We want to talk to you and we know you want to talk to us, but we can't do it when you're doing that with the glass. Can you stop the glass in the centre now, please? Stop being naughty. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's is this 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 is this
weird. Blasting it off. That flash ain't going off. You playing with my camera? No flash. That's really weird. Look at these black lines on every bloody picture. Now oh, the battery's dead. Is that you drained the battery power of my camera? Yeah, you 